Okay, we're going to turn in the Word this evening to Luke's Gospel and chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we'll begin to read from the verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, uh, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We'll just end the public reading of God's precious word there, and we'll just bow again in a wee word of prayer. Father, we do thank you again tonight for the pleasure that it is to join with God's people under your word. And we just thank you, Lord, again that we do live in the day of grace. And uh, we live, Lord, not knowing what's around the corner, but we know that salvation is guaranteed right now to the whosoever that will call upon your name. Uh, We don't know what the next few days will bring, never mind what a whole new year will bring. And that's why it is so important that each and every individual in this meeting tonight is prepared to meet God. We pray if there's any in our meeting that's still outside of Christ, still haven't experienced the salvation of the Lord, we pray that they will not put it off to the new year, but that they, they will get right with God tonight, that they will trust in God tonight and repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We look to you and we pray for your presence now and your help as we uh, look at this portion of Scripture uh, from this book from another world, Lord. We pray that you'll bless us uh, from beginning to end. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, eight days after the Lord Jesus was born and was led in a manger, we see here that his parents obey the law and they have their son circumcised. Of course, it was a painful operation where the baby would shed a little drop of blood. However, this baby would go on to shed great drops of blood and become the sacrificial lamb that would take our place and take away the sins of the world. 
40 days after his birth, Mary and Joseph, they come to the temple for the purification rites, which is described in Leviticus 12. Normally, a lamb would be sacrificed, but verse 24 here would suggest that Mary and Joseph were too poor to bring a lamb for this particular ceremony. However, they didn't realize it, but they had actually brought the Lamb of God with them that day. In Jerusalem, there was a man called Simeon. We're told here that he was just, he was devout, and part of the faithful Jewish remnant that were eagerly awaiting, awaiting the Messiah. God had revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Christ. The Spirit of God, in verse 27, at that exact time, led this man off the streets of Jerusalem into the temple where he met the Lord. And you know, many a poor lost soul ever since this day has unknowingly been led by the Spirit off the streets into a gospel meeting where they've been introduced to the Lord. Now that he had met the Lord, verse 29 says he was now ready to die. And so I wonder, friend, tonight as we come to this message, can you say, that you are ready to die like Simeon. You see, you can only be ready to die if you've met the Lord. You can only be ready to die if you've seen the Lord's Christ. And you can only be ready to die if you've been forgiven of your sin and your soul has been saved. Make sure that you're ready to die because 2020 could be the year that your soul is required of you. Verse 25 says that Simeon had been waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now that means he was waiting for and expecting the Messiah. In fact, one of the traditional Jewish prayers was, may I see the consolation of Israel. And that prayer was answered for Simeon when he saw Jesus Christ in the temple. And he declared here in verse 30, that mine eyes have seen thy salvation. How vitally important it is to see God's salvation before we see death. The greatest thing you could do in this life is to make sure that you have God's salvation before you die. Simeon here is now ready to die. Verse 29, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And that word depart in the Greek has several different meanings, and each of them tells us something and illustrates the death of the Christian. It means to release a prisoner, It means to untie a ship and set sail. It means to take down your tent, and it means to unyoke an ox from its burden. God's people should not be afraid to die this evening. Death for us only frees us from our burdens in this life and leads us to the blessings of the life to come. In verses 30 to 32, Simeon rejoices in song. You see, this child would not only provide salvation to the Jews, but also to us Gentiles. And I'm sure as he sang those words and mentioned the Gentiles, it must have turned a few heads in the temple that day. Through this child, a light would be brought to the Gentiles so that all people around the world could be saved. In verse 33, Luke is very careful to remind his readers that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but that Joseph was not the father of Jesus. He says, Joseph and his mother marveled. They marveled at the revelations of this stranger. And then Simeon turned to Mary, only Mary, perhaps knowing that Joseph would not live to see the cross at Calvary. And he said this child would grow up to bring deliverance, but not only deliverance, but great division and anguish. The sword that's mentioned here in verse 35 was for no one else but Mary alone. And it spoke of the suffering and the sorrow that she would endure as his mother. The verb pierce means a constant piercing. And you know, young people, we need to make sure that we are not a constant piercing to our mums and dads. The Bible says that we must honor our fathers and our mothers. Mary was to experience more and more sorrow until the day that she stood at the foot of the old rugged cross and saw her son suffer and die. But as much as Mary suffered... Only the sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ, could die for the sins of the world. We don't know how much Mary and Joseph understood about all of this, but we do know that Mary pondered these things in her heart. She put these things together to try and piece together God's will and purpose and plan for her life. 
And in the middle of all of this, we see another individual joins them in the temple. This time it is a woman, and her name is Anna. This lady had a special and a specific calling and unique ministry in the temple. And all we know about Anna really is contained in these three verses from 36 through to 38. And what we can draw out of these three verses is this, in fact, nine different things. First of all, we see here that she was on her own. She worked alone in the temple, serving her God. And you know, sometimes if we're going to wait for others to join us in the Lord's work, then we'll never do anything. Sometimes we just have to get on with it and do it all by ourselves. If you're waiting for your husband or your wife, perhaps, to join you before you come to the Lord, then that is a risky strategy to take. None of us knows what's around the corner. God says, now is the day of salvation, and my advice is for you to get saved now, and then you can begin to pray for your loved ones to come into the kingdom. God answered Simeon's prayer to see the Lord, and I believe he will answer your prayer according to his will. Anna's name in the Hebrew means gracious or merciful. God had graciously intervened in her life. He had shown her mercy, had forgiven her her sin, and saved her soul. She had so much to be grateful for. After all, she had been rescued from punishment. Her life was never the same since the day that she had met the Lord. And all she wanted to do now was to serve him and recommend him to other people. Others may not have wanted to join her, but Anna didn't care. Like Mary, she rejoiced in God, her Savior. For her, doing all she could for God was her number one and top priority. Everything else took a back seat. She may have been alone in the Lord's work, but God had promised her that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is the impact that God can have in your life. When God enters your life, things will radically change and you will never be the same again. People may not join you on your journey if you do decide to follow Christ, but you will have a friend that will stick closer than any brother. We also see that Anna was a prophetess. Now, being a prophetess meant that she had a special gift by declaring and interpreting God's message. Prophets faithfully preach God's word to the people. Prophets like Isaiah preached boldly against the corruption in his day, and as a result, they were often hated by the people. Much like us in the open air in Dungannon, we're often hated by the people, and sometimes they make that known. The Bible also warns us against false prophets, those who deceive the people and who do not represent God. You'll remember that King Ahab, he had 400 false prophets and they just told him what he wanted to hear. Jesus told us to watch out for false prophets like that who would appear in sheep's clothing but inwardly would be ferocious wolves. And in fact, we have the false preachers in our own land today and they're not very far from here. They will walk in the pride parades, they will carry the rainbow flag, they will run special services for the LGBT people. They will bless them in their sin and condemn those poor, blinded young people to an eternity in the lake of fire. They are false prophets, false preachers. Like Ahab's prophets, they tell the people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. But a preacher of God will speak the truth. He will warn people that sodomy is a sin which must be repented of. A true prophet will never contradict God's revealed word. A true prophet will be like Micaiah who said, As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. Anna was a true prophetess because after she met the Lord, she went and she spoke the truth. What God said, she said. We also see that she was the daughter of Phanuel. Her father's name was Phanuel, which in the Hebrew means before the face of God. On this day, she was literally before the face of God when she saw Jesus Christ as a baby. And you know, folks, one day we shall all be before the face of God. Either we shall go to him or he will come to us. It really makes no difference. We shall see him and we shall meet him. And if we're ready, we will be with him in the new Jerusalem for all eternity. But if we're not ready, he will cast us into the lake of fire. Hebrews says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But Anna did not fear. She rejoiced. This baby was her savior. This was the God that she'd been living for, the God that she'd been praying to, the God that she had adored since the day he saved her soul. 
I wonder, friend, tonight, when you meet God, will it be a fearful thing or will it be a wonderful thing? We're also told that she was of the tribe of Asher. Asher was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So obviously, Anna was an Israelite. Asher was Jacob's eighth son, and his mother was Zilpah, uh, who was Leah's maidservant. When Asher was born, Leah declared, happy am I. And so Asher means blessed or happy. When Jacob blessed his sons before his death, he said in Genesis, out of Asher his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. So Asher's food would not only be blessed, but it would also be fit for a king. The tribe of Asher would then go on to possess the fertile land that run along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. However, after the land was conquered by Asher, the tribe settles for the easy life. They do business with the Canaanites and they refuse to assist their fellow Israelites in times of war. When the time for action came, they failed to trust in God and to honor his plan. And yet, many, many years later, we see that Anna was a lady who wasn't prepared to sit back and let someone else do the work. When God called her into action, she stepped forward and gave her all to her king. When the world watched on, they probably thought that she was wasting her life, wasting her life away. But for Anna, this was life. And her thoughts were like Paul's words, who said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I have no doubt today the world looks on at the Christian and thinks that we're wasting our lives away. And they call our God the sky fairy or our imaginary friend. But we know that we have life and that our God reigns. They looked at Anna and they thought that she had the most boring life ever. And I've no doubt that they've looked at us in 2019 going to church on a Sunday morning as they go to the shops and cinemas and restaurants and beaches and think that we have the most boring life. But they have, no, they have absolutely no idea that we have an abundant life and it's the best life ever. I shall receive many blessings from God, but when blessed, they were expected to obey the Lord's commands. And you know, folks, we've all been blessed in 2019 by God and The Lord expects us to obey his commands. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And just as Asher received a prophetic blessing from Jacob, God's children have received this promise in Jeremiah for the future as well. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. We can praise the Lord for his wonderful plans for his children. And what a comfort to know as we leave another year behind, we have a God tonight that goes before us into 2020 and nothing will happen to us and nothing will happen to our own wee tribe that is outside God's perfect plan and will. We also see that Anna was of a great age. Anna by now was well advanced in years and it it is written that here that she was 84 She was 84, and yet she was still serving God. Wasn't Abraham 100 and Sarah 91 when she gave birth to Isaac, beginning the nation of Israel? Wasn't Moses 80 before he was called to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage? Wasn't Joshua almost 80 when he took over from Moses and entered into the promised land? Wasn't Caleb 85 when he successfully conquered the city of Hebron? The city of Hebron was a gift to Caleb from Joshua, but Caleb still had to take it. And it reminds us all tonight of eternal life. It is a gift from God, but we still have to take it. We still have to accept it. We still have to possess it. But the point is this. When we consider all those men, you're never too old to serve the Lord. And everyone this side of eternity still has their part to play. Can you imagine what would have happened if those people that we've just mentioned had retired when they were 65? The Bible would be a whole lot different if we had a Bible at all. God uses all kinds and all ages of people to accomplish his work, most of whom will never have their name on PowerPoint presentation or in lights or even be noticed by anyone else. Most people going into the temple probably never noticed that little old widow woman. But God certainly did. 
She was playing a significant role in the plan of God, and God chose her to meet his son. There were something like 18,000 priests in Israel at that time, but very, very few of them have their name in God's book. But God, God ensured Anna's name was in his book. That's how important she was to God. You see, you don't have to be great in the eyes of man to accomplish great things for God. In fact, Paul commended and thanked the Christians in Corinth, even though not many of them were intelligent or influential or even of noble birth. So never ever think that God can only use preachers and teachers or missionaries. God knows your gifts and your circumstances, and he will use you right where you are. You can be an example of Christ's love to others all around you. Even in this fellowship, people are hurting. People are lonely. People are discouraged. People are angry. 2019 has brought things into people's lives that they never expected to face. And God can use you in 2020 to remind those same people that they are not alone. In 2020, a kind word, caring smile, a phone call, a text message, or even a visit can remind people that God cares for them and God loves them. The kindest thing you can do for anyone is to pray for them, and that is something that we can all do, no matter how old we are or how physically limited we may be. We will never know what effect our prayers have had on people this side of heaven, but God knows, and he commands us to pray for those who are in need. And that's why Anna was a woman of prayer. James says, pray one for another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God has a message for folk who are retired and think that they might be of no use to God anymore. He says in the Psalms, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Anna lived out this verse every day of her life. And now this can be your motto verse for 2020 as well. You may not be able to knock doors and bring people into a mission, but you can pray them into the kingdom. And God needs you. We also see that Anna was a widow. Widows didn't have an easy life in those days. Often they were exploited and neglected in spite, in spite of the instructions from God in the Old Testament. Book of Isaiah says, plead for the widow. Exodus says, ye shall not afflict any widow. In Deuteronomy it says, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase and shalt lay it up at the gates. And the widow within the gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied. You see, even in the Old Testament, God had provided a welfare system for the widows in Israel. Anna had been married for only seven years, and then her husband died. So she had been a widow for a long, long time, and she had never remarried. She was a bride of Christ, and that was the only husband she was now interested in. We also see that she was a servant of God. She was a very godly lady, this woman. She rarely left the temple. The service of God was her life. She was well past what we might call retirement years, but she wasn't found on the golf course, nor was she found taking life easy in some holiday home. She was busy here serving her king. There will be plenty of time to rest in heaven, and indeed, she's been resting in heaven for the past 2,000 years already. She was a prayer warrior, and she fasted regularly. In fact, it says she fasted and prayed night and day. Increasingly, Christians are finding it more and more difficult to be in God's house twice on a Sunday. And I think the empty pews tonight, not only in this fellowship, but probably in every fellowship, would be a witness to that. The comforts of home, the central heating, the entertainment, the Wi-Fi is just so much more appealing. But Anna was in the temple 24-7. Verse 37 says she departed not from the temple she was always there. Visitors to Jerusalem might have asked on the streets, where is the prophetess Anna? We need her advice. We need to speak to her. And the locals would always say, well, she's in the temple with God. She's worshiping God. She's praying to God. She's serving God. Where else would she be? I wonder is that what your children would say or be able to say about you if someone came to your door? Well, daddy's having his quiet time. Or mommy's reading her Bible. In 2020, when the midweek meeting comes around, will your child have to ask where you're going on a Thursday night 
Or will they be able to know for sure that that's the night that mommy and daddy goes out to the prayer meeting to pray for me? What an inspirational lady Anna was and is to us all. You see, you can't call yourself a follower of Christ if you have no desire to spend time with Christ. That's really the bottom line. When some Christians step up or step out into eternity, I believe it's going to be an awful shock to the system. But for Anna, it is simply going home to heaven to be with her Savior. The one that she had met and served and worshipped and praised, spoke with and shared to others about all her life. When, When Anna went to heaven, it was no shock to her. We would say she would have hit the ground running. We also see that she praised God. Anna, like Simeon, had also been waiting for the coming of the Lord's anointed. Verse 38, she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. You see, God's timing is always, always perfect. Anna came up just as Simeon was praising the Lord for the baby, so she joined in the celebrations and the singing. The long wait was over. Her many years of dedicated service to God had all been worth it, for now she saw her Savior face to face. While Simeon lifted his hands, his heart, and his voice to the Lord, Anna praises the Lord. She gives thanks to the Lord. She joins with Simeon, and they both lift up their voices in praise to the Lord. They didn't bottle up what they were feeling on the inside. The psalmist says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Their praise was also visible. Anna wasn't afraid to stand with Simeon as he lifts the baby Jesus and held him high to praise him. She was not embarrassed to vocally and visibly praise the Redeemer. Again, the psalm says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Friends, never ever be ashamed or embarrassed or afraid to clap and lift your, your hands in praising God. If that's what you really want to do, if he has saved you, then you have good reason to praise him. When Simeon and Anna praised the Lord in the temple that day, the focus was then, it was taken off the rituals of another dead meeting, and it was placed on the Lord God of heaven. And maybe for someone here tonight, your Christianity in 2019, and in fact really all your life, it has been nothing but a life of ritual worship. Well, now is the time to take your eyes off the rituals and to place them on the Lord God of heaven. Your rituals will not save you. Your baptism, your confirmation, and your constant clocking in and out of church will not deal with your sin. You must stop trusting in the rituals of the church and start to trust in the head of the church. And then finally, we see that she shared this great news. Anna did much more than praise God in the temple. She preached about God outside the temple. Anna blends her voice with that of Simeon, but she goes even further. She tells others about what God is doing. So her praise was not only vocal and visible, it was also verbal. She spoke to them all that looked for redemption in Israel. Anyone who was concerned about their salvation and was willing to listen to the gospel, well, Anna was certainly willing to share the gospel with them. When Jesus healed the Gadarene demoniac, He told him to go home to your friends and tell them what great things the God has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And you know, when we share the wonderful news of God's redemption, we are praising the Lord. Anna had been waiting a long time for the Redeemer to arrive. And now that he was finally here, she wasn't going to keep it to herself. So folks, as we approach another year, let's let's be determined not to keep the gospel to ourselves. Let's get involved in the building of God's kingdom. Let's be like Simeon who gave thanks for the Redeemer and let's be like Anna who shared the wonderful message with everyone that she met. You see, he's not only the Redeemer of Israel, but for all who would just repent and trust in him. Verse 38 says, Anna spake of him. And of course she spoke of him. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. Every Christian should be speaking about him. And when we head up to Dungannon for the open air on a Saturday, there shouldn't just be two or three of us. We should saturate that place with 20 or 30 of us. Wonder do you speak of your Savior to others that you meet? You see, you'll never know what a little testimony or a little praise or a little witness 
will accomplish. Having obeyed the law in everything, verse 39 now tells us that Mary and Joseph returned to Nazareth, which would be the Lord's home until he began his public ministry about 30 years later. But what is missing from that verse 39 is what is told to us in Matthew's gospel. Before going to Nazareth, they returned to live in Bethlehem where they would be visited by the wise men who would bring them gifts from the east and then they would flee to Egypt to escape the fury of Herod. And when you think about it, it didn't take long before Simeon's prophecy of persecution in verses 34 and 35 would begin. And it wasn't until the death of Herod that the family was able to return home again to Nazareth. We all know that home is a wonderful place to be. You know, this, friends, is the last Sunday night meeting of 2019. And wouldn't it be great to begin another new year knowing that you have secured a new home in heaven? Wouldn't it be great to leave your sins behind in 2019 and walk with Jesus of Nazareth into 2020? The fact is, you can do that tonight. Like Simeon, you can behold his salvation. Like Anna, you can spend the rest of your life enjoying his presence and experiencing his love and serving your Savior. A peaceful new year, you know, is just not something that you scribble on a Christmas card. It is something to experience in the soul. And it can be experienced in your soul tonight. So friends, I would encourage you tonight, if you're still not ready to meet God, trust him, take him, accept him, possess him, and you will not be disappointed.